I'm Rachel Maines. I'm an historian of technology, and I am a visiting scientist in the um, Electrical and Computer Engineering School at uh, Cornell University. I expected it to derail my career, and it did. <laughs> uh, I, I have never been like a tenured faculty member anywhere. I've, I've been a professor, now I'm a visiting scientist, and I love it, but uh, it, it, because it, when I first started working on it, it was so controversial that nobody wanted to touch it. Uh, I, couldn't even get, I couldn't even get an article published on it except in this little magazine associated with the, the Bakken Library and Museum of Electricity in Life, which is out in Minneapolis. Uh, and even they later began to think better of it, but it was too late by then, of course. Once you've published, you've published. Uh, but then after working on the, on the thing for like, well, I guess it was more than 20 years, um, it came out in 1999, which turned out to be the perfect year for it, although, I mean, I didn't know that. I couldn't have. Uh, but, I, you know, that's when I finished it, and it came, it, it came out, and people just went bonkers over it. it was, they even did a, um, a Law and Order Special Victims uh, Unit thing with, with a little vignette of, from my book, and I was like, it's not what an historian expects. But it, it's, been a, it's been quite a trip, and now there's been a movie and a, um, a play, uh, which is uh, running right, right now at the Lyceum. Uh, and I'm told, Scouts Honor, a puppet musical. Uh, you're going to laugh at me, uh, because what I thought was going to happen was that my colleagues would talk about it a lot, and uh, that it would be reviewed in the scholarly journals. Um, and that, that's all I expected. I thought maybe a few people might use it as a textbook. But actually, it's used as a textbook in about 150 colleges and universities around the world. It's been translated now. I think it's now in three languages. Uh, and people just loved my hypothesis. And that's all it is, really, is an hypothesis that, that women were treated with massage for this disease, hysteria, which has supposedly existed since the time of Hippocrates, 450 BC, and that the vibrator was invented to treat this disease. Well, people just thought this was such a cool idea that people believe it, that it's like a fact. And I'm like, it's a hypothesis, it's a hypothesis. But it doesn't matter. You know, if people like it so much, they don't want to hear any doubts about it. Eventually, somebody will sit down and say, now, maybe there's another way to interpret these data. But in the meantime, I'm really kind of enjoying all the attention that my book gets, <laughs> as you can imagine. Well, hysteria was diagnosed by uh, Hippocrates, as I mentioned, that's 4, 450 BC, so that's really quite a long time. It didn't really go out of fashion as a diagnosis. Well, it was legislated out of existence in 1957. Uh, by the American, I think it's American Psychiatric Association. Um, but it, there's still a catch-all category for things. Uh, Charles Lassaguet, who was a 19th century French physician, once said that hysteria was the, the waste paper basket of otherwise unemployed medical symptoms. And into this waste paper basket went all sorts of things from antiquity until, well, until Freud's time. And he then he put a new interpretation on what hysteria was. Uh, and that's the one that we kind of we remember most most often, um, but the the disease that the quote disease uh, that is described by um, Hippocrates and by Thomas Sydenham, who's a uh, just trying to remember 17th century, uh, he's they called the English Hippocrates. He's a historical British physician. Uh, it really sounds a lot more like sexual frustration. She uh, she's nervous. She's uh, she has trouble sleeping. She has trouble with anxiety. She has these vague feelings of uh, heaviness in the abdomen. Uh, and then my two favorite symptoms, you don't see this in every, every uh, description, but you see them in enough to make you suspicious. Uh, one of the symptoms is sexual fantasy, and the other is vaginal lubrication. And if these are symptoms, there are an awful lot of sick people out there, right? And they found a lot of sick people. They, they thought in the 19th century, for example, that three quarters of all women, middle, middle class women, uh, suffered from hysteria. And, and if those are the symptoms, maybe they did. In some cases, it was innocence. But in, uh, I wasn't even sure of the, my hypothesis myself until I saw uh, the works of a, of a fellow named Nathaniel Highmore, who wrote about hysteria in 1666. And he wrote, he wrote in Latin, so it's a very good thing I took that, you know, did all that classics back in as an undergrad. 
um, that he said, uh, he just calls what you're, he's producing. He tells you all about how to do it. Well, you know, here you get some oil, you know, and you get all, you know, greased up. And then you, you know, the fingers of this hand go in here and the fingers of the other hand go here. And, and then she'll get to breathe hard and then there'll be uh, contractions and she'll get all red in the face, you know. And, he, and then he just goes right on and says, well, it's an orgasm, you know. But it's your job to do this because you're a doctor, right? And you have to relieve the symptoms. And she will feel better for a while and she'll be back, you know, if she can afford to come to the doctor regularly. So it was a, it was a great way for a doctor to make a living. You know, this, these women are not really sick and they're not going to get well either. So, you know, uh, it was, it, that was one of the things you notice about the, in the 19th century. The doctors actually write about that, that it's a good source of revenue. Um, but some of the doctors actually in the, in the, um, in the, the, in the, in the seventeenth century, it, it, that is in Highmore's time, in Britain, uh, Audrey Eccles, who's a British historian of medicine, has documented that there was actually a, uh, a split between Protestant and Catholic doctors about whether it was really um, uh, appropriate for doctors to be doing this, because they knew what was going on at that time they did. It's not clear if they did it in the nineteenth century or not. Um, but apparently the, the, the Catholic doctor said, well, it's your duty to do this. So, you know, she might, might, she might die of it, you know, or <laughs> really. <laughs> uh, so you have to do this. And the Protestant doctors were like, oh, oh, we mustn't, you know, terrible thing, you know. Um, but apparently that, you know, it was, that all was gone by the 19th century and the doctors were, most of them were saying, oh, it's nothing sexual. It can't be anything sexual because there's no penetration and therefore no sex, right? Can't be. It has to be something else. Hysterical paroxysm, that's what we're seeing. It's like the breaking of a fever when you have a cold, you know, and you, you get all, you're all feverish for a while and then the fever breaks and you feel better. Yeah, see, that's it. The crisis of the disease, very Galenic. Uh, so they had their complete explanation there. But some of them even then knew, uh, one of them who did was a fellow named, a French physician, that would be a French physician, right? Uh, Auguste Tripier, uh, and he says in, I think it's 1883, he says, look, guys, and he does mean guys because he's speaking to an audience of, of uh, physicians and they're all guys, uh, look, you know, you know as well as I do that this is une crise venérienne, this is a, an, an orgasm, a, vener a, uh, a sexual crisis. Uh, but it, we're doing it anyway. It's just as if we're masturbating these patients. And they were like, we don't want to hear it, accused, You know, and they just, they, they just ignored it, went right on. The only thing that stopped them, I think what stopped them, there are two things. One of them is, uh, well, actually three. Um, F Freud comes along and he, uh, he, he attempts massage therapy for hysteria and it turns out he doesn't, he's never good at it. Uh, this is the guy who didn't know what women wanted, right? So he, he decided he'd sit them up and talk to them instead. And, uh, and that, we can go on from there. But in any case, that's one thing that happened is Freud comes along and reinterprets hysteria, what it is. Oh, it's lesions in the consciousness. You know? no, it's not, nothing to do with sex. You know? uh, the second thing that comes along is there begins to be a little more knowledge about women and their sexuality. Not a whole lot, but there is some early sexology uh, that uh, that is very persuasive um, and people begin to say well you know maybe women do have sexuality maybe it's not unhealthy you know uh, and then the third thing that happens and this is this is the real killer as it were uh, the vibrator begins to appear in pornography and then the doctors go ah and just drop it like a hot rock you know they don't want anything more to do with it because you know you, it's obvious that what they're doing is exactly what these women are doing to themselves in these, like, you know what a cabinet card is, it's about like this, and that's sort of a 19th century, early 20th century. Um, you could buy them for respectable things like a uh, theater, theater stars, so you could get a picture of like, you know, who the, whoever the famous stars were, and, and you could get like really weird ones, and you could get ones of disasters, but you could also get pornographic ones, and there were these images of women with, uh, with vibrators. And then by the 20s, we have uh, the vibrator being used in films. Um, and of course, like uh, I, have a, I have a colleague, uh, and I'm always, I'm always plugging his work, Jonathan uh, Coopersmith, he's at uh, Texas A&M. He's written a wonderful article called Pornography at Progress. And he, he uh, makes the point that the, all these technologies like cabinet cards, the telephone, fax machine, um, video, the internet, uh, that the sexuality has seized on these things 
and turned them to its own purposes, thereby providing a stream of capital into the development of these technologies. And so you and I can sit here talking to each other through a video screen, uh, and a lot of the capital for the development of the technology was funded by that good old standby, human sexuality. Uh, they, they came out of, um, of massage, tech, hand technology for massage. Uh, there, there is some, there's a connection with water, um, hydrotherapy. Uh, anybody, any woman who owns a shower massage we can explain the details to you. Uh, <laughs> if you need them explained, which you probably don't. Uh, but in any case, uh, it's possible that even Roman women knew about this. Um, we're, we're not sure. Uh, but in any case, there's the connection with hydrotherapy. And then uh, you wondered why Saratoga was so popular in the 19th century. Well, it was, especially with women, the men would go off and gamble and the women would go for the water cure. And sometimes it was very respectable and, you know, they just bathed in the water and everything was cool. But there was also this thing called uh, the douche, the scotch douche that was, uh, I've seen pictures of and it was pretty startling. Um, anyway, uh, there was those, those technologies, 1869, a, uh, an American, George Taylor, invents a machine he calls the manipulator, which is basically a steam-powered coal-fired vibrator. Uh, and because all you have to do is say steam-powered vibrator and people start to, to snicker. You know, I mean, it is a funny idea. But doctors didn't like this thing because, it, of course, it was, it was what, they, what we historians of technology call a centralizing technology. You have to bring the patient to the technology. You can't take the technology to the patient. And, of course, the other thing doctors didn't like about it was having to shovel coal into it, you know, because that's, that's what, you know, it, it wasn't in the same room with the patient. It was, um, you know how in pictures of 19th century factories you see all these drive trains um, that are leather straps? Well, that's how the power was transferred. There was a steam engine in one room with a, with a drive train. And then in the next room, at the other end of the drive train, uh, was this table with a vibrating sphere in the middle of it that she would lay the patient across. And, uh, and that was that was the so that was the, the the immediate predecessor technology, and then in the 1880s in Britain, uh, a fellow by the name of Joseph Mortimer Granville uh, invents with the modern electromechanical vibrator that we all know and love, uh, and it was attached to because there was no line electricity in 1883, uh, it was attached to this huge 40-pound wet cell battery slosh slosh that you had to tote around if you wanted to take it anywhere. And it was attached by these completely uninsulated wires. You look at them now and you go, ooh. Uh, and it, it wrapped around these little brass posts. And the, the vibrator itself, uh, the, the vibrating mechanism, it's basically just a sloppy electrical motor. You know, all motors vibrate because they're, they're slightly sloppy. Well, you just make it a little sloppier on purpose and the thing will vibrate, right? Easy, easy enough. Things about like this is wrapped, it's got a leather uh, covering around it. And it's got these vibratodes with little ivory, um, little ivory tips on them. The vibratodes are what we would now call the attachments. Uh, they, I, my, my husband thinks that vibratodes is a really great word. And he, he was, he's trying to get, get it back into the language, you know, like maybe as a name of a rock group, you know, Crazy Eddie and the Vibratodes. Um, but anyway, it's, it's a, it, that's, it had attachments as, even as early as the very first model. And it was manufactured by a perfectly respectable um, British instrument maker, but it's still in business, Weiss. Uh, but they, they didn't stay in the vibrant business very long after, they, after things started to look a little shaky. Um, in the, uh, at the turn of the century, they had, um, they, the, the, the vibrator kind of split into two, uh, two, two product lines. One was for doctors and one was for consumers. And the, the doctors really hated the idea that there were consumer vibrators out there. But, you know, the, when the market speaks, you know, <laughs> everybody listens, <laughs> including doctors. They better. Uh, there were these relatively inexpensive, uh, some that looked like an egg beater for people who didn't have electricity. Um, and and uh, it sounded like one, too. Uh, and there were, um, there were battery-powered ones. Uh, there were even water-powered ones that you could attach to your sink. This was before water was metered. It's like basically little tiny turbines about, about this big. Uh, and they, they apparently worked. Uh, I've never seen one, a real one, but I've seen ads. Uh, and then they, uh, the ones that everybody thinks are the funniest, which are the doctor's models, because they look like, uh, there's one that I have a picture of that looks like a cross between 
a visitor from outer space and an old-fashioned telephone. Uh, and it's got this dial with little mother-of-pearl buttons that don't have anything on them at all. So it's just like fast, faster, fastest, you know, but you, but you got to look scientific so you have the little pearl, mother-of-pearl buttons, right? <laughs> you know, uh, the patient will be so impressed. And these were quite expensive. Uh, the, 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 the model that everybody seems to like the best, the Chattanooga, uh, which had to be shipped by freight because it was so heavy, it stood about, about five feet tall. And in fact, it's in the, the vibrator play, uh, the In the Next Room, Sarah Rules play. Uh, they've, they've made a, a reproduction Chattanooga. Uh, and it, it rolled on wheels, uh, and it, uh, it had to have a, a huge counterweight, about this big, because uh, with the, the vibratode attached to the vibrating head, uh, at about the five foot level, if you rolled it up to the, uh, rolled it around, it would have fall over if it didn't have this counterweight. So people always ask, why is there this box on the bottom? Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> because it's so, <laughs> it's so top heavy, it would fall over. Uh, and that would, would cost a hundred dollars at a time when you could buy a small house for two hundred dollars. So these are very expensive machines. And of course, in the 1920s, they all just disappeared because doctors didn't want to have anything more to do with vibrators. So that's where the technology came from. Meanwhile, the, the consumer technology is going off into the direction uh, that really, it, it, they're, except for being all made of metal instead of plastic, they're not distinguishable from modern vibrators. Sears used to make one, uh, a vibrator. In fact, you could buy a motor. Uh, there's, a, there's a picture of this in my, in my book on vibrators. You could buy a motor from Sears, a little electric motor, but yay. Uh, and you could buy a vibrator attachment, a beater, a grinder, a fan, a mixer, uh, and I think there were a couple, buffer, there was a buffer as well. So, you know, no home should be without one. And they weren't even that expensive, you know. Um, but they, as I say, doctors didn't like it, that there was all this self-treatment going on. But doctors always disapprove of self-treatment. Well, uh, they tell me, I, I don't know for sure, I'm, you know, I'm basically a historian, so I don't really know, but uh, they, they tell me that about one household in three has some kind of a, uh, of a sex toy in it, um, either a vibrator or something else. Uh, but vibrators are extremely popular. They sell very well. Uh, it's hard to know for sure how many are sold uh, because uh, the, the U.S. Bureau of the Census, Census of Manufacturers, doesn't have a separate category for them. They're just in the... I think it's small personal appliances, so they're in there with hair dryers and curling irons and things like that, and so you can't really tell. Um, but, and I think that the figures are, they're getting, they're, the numbers are going up every year, and they, they have not been hit by the recession at all, I'm told. I mean, what else are you going to do, right? It's too expensive to go out to the movies, so you stay home, right? Oh, no, actually, I don't know. Uh, I know that, that it's becoming more popular. Uh, and then there, there are now, as there never used to be, <laughs> uh, models especially for men. Uh, and I'm, I'm told that one of the things that uh, uh, one of my friends liked about the, the play is that there's a scene with a man and a vibrator in it. Um, of industrial democracies, no, there are not any that don't have them. Um, I think the only, I, I think it's one of those things where it's like washing machines. Um, if you can afford washing machines, you have washing machines. If you can't afford washing machines, you don't have them. Uh, and electricity is, uh, is we, we're very fortunate in having, as, as inex it seems expensive to us, but it isn't really. Uh, we have as inexpensive electricity and it's readily available uh, and it's not limited by things like batteries. You know, we can recharge, if we want to recharge batteries, we can recharge them. Uh, but that's not true all over the world. There are a lot of people who don't even have clean water. Uh, and I think that they make, uh, they make dildos and things like that even in pre-industrial societies. So I think that the, the, uh, the impulse to be playful about sex is, is, I think that's just a human thing. And recently we're finding that it's true of some animals. We've found that it's true of the marine mammals. Uh, they didn't, you know, the, 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 the biologist told us for years that, oh no, animals are very serious about sex, you know, uh, it's just business, you know. But then, you know, they found out that even different species of marine animal will just like, you know, spend all day playing with each other sexually, like for no apparent reason, just that's, that's Hey, it's fun, you know, here we all are in the water, you know. <laughs>
Well, I'm told, uh, I, I learned this just the uh, day before yesterday uh, at, uh, at the Philoctetes Institute. Doesn't that sound educational? And it is, too. I was, I was asked to be a part of a, a roundtable there. Um, and a young woman got up and talked about something called the, uh, the Real Doll, um, which is a, a, a programmable um, uh, female type of person. <laughs> person. Or female, basically, it's a female robot. Uh, or sex bot, as I'm told you should call them. Um, that has, you know, has like programmable, uh, the, the oral cavity is programmable. Uh, she didn't mention any of the other body parts, but I, I gather they all are. Uh, my, and now, it's, of course, it's hideously expensive. Any kind of robot is very expensive. Even the ones that, that just vacuum carpet are not cheap. Um, but yeah, that's, that's one of the directions it's going. There are now things you could buy to install in your bathtub that are, are kind of, to me, of course, they're, you know, they're electronic and they have, uh, and in fact, one of the, the technical challenges is that water and electronics don't mix. Uh, and the inventors, the, the engineers who, who build these things are really having trouble with that, keeping the electronics. That's why it's so hard to get a reliable dishwasher that has electronic controls. Because you've got hot, something hot, you've got something wet, and you've got electronics, which are not a good combination. Um, they, they go in your bathtub and you're programmable and it, they're, they're for women. Uh, and you sort of ride them. Uh, like I don't really have a, a clear picture in my mind of what they're like, but I, I'm... I've had them described to me, and oh, and I think there's one called um, Amazing Saddles. That's it. There's one called Amazing Saddles. So probably if you Googled on Amazing Saddles, you'd find it. Um, and then there's um, there's a lot of dual action stuff now uh, that the, the, you know the penetration is not. Um, m most women are, don't have orgasm just with penetration alone, but I mean, you know. If you have got, you've got, you got both, well, you know. And so there are these penetrative dildo-type vibrators that also have a, a dual action. Um, you've seen the ones with the little rabbit, you know, with the ears that go like this. And, and some of them are really very cute. Um, so they've, they've gotten more playful, and I'm, I'm sure they're going to get more technological. Uh, and there's all these things now where people do elaborate hookups with the internet. And I'm so, I'm so well, it's funny, I'm so old fashioned, you know, I, I wrote this book, but everybody, everybody thinks, oh, she must know all about this stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> I've been married for 30 years, you know, I, you know. <laughs> oh, yes, definitely, yes. And, and I think that that's a, that's a very good bridge, thank you. Uh, that's, a, that's a good transition into it because, um, you know, you read about, um, um, medieval sex, for example, and a lot of it is very businesslike. It's in the dark. People still have part of their clothes on. It's not warm enough in the room. You can't take all your clothes off. Uh, and so, and, and sex toys too. They're they're a function of leisure and industrialization, um, of prosperity. They're, these are things that have to do with prosperity, and all of these other hedonizing technologies. In fact, I think if I remember correctly, the book opens with a, a discussion of sex as a as a as a sort of hedonized activity that. It's like gourmet cooking. You know, I just was in Whole Foods a little while ago, and you know, nobody has to cook anymore. That if, if, if you have enough money, you don't have to cook. And even if you don't have a whole lot of money, you still don't have to cook. <laughs> you, can, if you can stand eating in McDonald's, you know, and things like that, okay, you know. Uh, if you, in, in an industrial, in the industrial democracies, you don't have to cook, um, and, you, and you're prosperous enough. But people, there are now a whole lot of people who cook just because they like to, like my husband and me. You know, we like, we like to, we have all these, you know, all clad pans hanging in our kitchen. And, you know, we like, my, my idea of a remedy for seasonal affective disorder, you know, when it's gloomy. And, and up, it's, in upstate New York, it's often very gloomy, especially this time of year when it gets dark early. So get like a pork shoulder and braise it in, in herbs and saffron and wine and all this stuff all day. So the whole house smells great all day long. Uh, and that's the kind of thing people do when a technology becomes hedonized. When you don't have to do it, then you have the, uh, you, can look, you can step back from it and say, now how could I have fun with this? And that's what's happened with hunting, fishing, needlework, um, Cake decorating, which used to be something that only professionals did uh, after World War II, uh, it became a hobby for housewives. Uh, and now, n not just housewives, but house husbands too. <laughs> Why not? Uh, and there's all these other things. In fact, 
I, I learned when I was writing that book, it's the most fun I ever had writing a book, uh, that every, every time I think, okay, I'm now I'm going to finish this manuscript, I'm going to send it to Hopkins, you know, and I was, oh, just one more. I just have to have, it's like eating potato chips. I, I, I've just got to do one more. Oh, I've just learned about, you know, like boating is another example. And, uh, or there'd be, I can't remember what they all are, but there's a whole bunch of them in there. Leatherworking is one of them. Uh, and there's a literature of all of them. And I had, I had a lot of fun with that. Yes, and the, particularly the ones that also became obsolete for production purposes, like knitting socks. Like, you know, ab absolutely nobody, almost anywhere in the world, has to knit socks. Very few people now live in such remote areas that they have to knit their own socks. You know? uh, and it's usually much more cost effective to just go out and buy a pair. Uh, in fact, the, the yarn to make yourself a pair of handmade wool socks costs about five times as much as a pair of socks does, right? Even a pair of good ones. Um, but if you like to knit socks, you know, uh, then, you know, what's wrong with that, right? You Can, can't do any harm knitting socks. Uh, that's, a, that's an example. But there's a bunch of others that are like that. Um, Printmaking. Um, it, when it used to be that uh, lithography was used by professionals. Uh, in fact, uh, Collier's Magazine, you've probably seen those old covers, those are lithographed. Uh, but when lithography became obsolete as a, as a production printing technology, the artisans seized on it and said, oh, wow. And then you have things like, the, what's it called, the Tamarind Workshop, which is a famous historical, it's a printmaking workshop, and there are all these famous artists who got involved in it. Um, so that's another example of throwing pots, m making ceramics. Uh, that's once it became, you know, n n buying um, hand-thrown pots is... is something you do if you have a lot of money. You don't, you don't just, you know, it's not like Roman times where you know, all the pots were hand thrown. Uh, but, the, but the people who like to do it use the technology that they, they pick. Sometimes they pick high tech. Sometimes they want to operate with a foot pedal. Sometimes they want it electrically powered. That's the other thing is that you get to vote, as it were, with your dollars on what technology you're going to use. It isn't a question of what's efficient. Because efficiency doesn't matter, right? Nobody cares. Uh, you, whatever gives you the most pleasure, that's why I call it hedonizing technology. <laughs> well, you know, I, I wondered about that. I've wondered about that myself. I, I know people who like to wash dishes by hand. I keep thinking that there's tasks that can't be hedonized. In fact, I used to think that um, ironing couldn't. And, um, and then I, I, one of my colleagues, um, Rebecca, Rebecca Herzl, as a matter of fact, came up to me at a meeting and said, have you heard about ExtremeIroning.com? <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> and she said, Extreme Ironing. And, you know, and go, just go there and you'll see what I mean. And sure enough, it's hedonized ironing. Now, these people are not really, well, I mean, you could say they're ironing. That is a, they, you know how you were, uh, some of us, maybe not you, but some of us were taught uh, in home economics class, in my case, how to iron a, a man's shirt. You start with the yoke, you know, you iron that, and then, uh, boy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, now I'm gonna have trouble remembering. And then I think you should do the side with the buttons, the front side with the buttons, then the side with the buttonholes, then the sleeves of the collar is last. Well, this, this, this um, orthodoxy of shirt ironing is the rules now of the sport, sport of extreme ironing. Now, if it makes the Olympics, I'll, in my lifetime, I'll be very impressed. But it's already pretty, pretty amazing. The, the, uh, there's an outfit in Britain called Rowenta that makes irons. And they sponsor an annual extreme ironing contest. Uh, and like the, uh, the one that I have in the book, the example I have in the book is um, the, the Wolfberg Cracks in South Africa, you know, these huge canyons. Well, this guy's got himself, and these are interesting, these are mostly guys. Uh, this guy has got himself suspended on a tight wire between the Wolfberg cracks and, and on his, and he's got a harness holding him onto the wire, and standing on, he's got the ironing board on his feet, like, uh, and he's ironing this shirt over the Wolfberg cracks. He was the 2003 winner of the Rowenta Trophy for extreme ironing. They've got scuba ironers, they've got uh, uh, polar ironers. Um, I can't remember what they. Oh, excuse me, they're called ironists. Ironists. There are you know, like people standing on top of, uh, you know, the, those very tall signs that they have on, on freeway gas stations. 
people like a whole group of them up there ironing. <laughs> uh, and that's that's extreme ironing. So you uh, you you can't tell what's going to be next. Uh, might be washing dishes, cleaning the oven. You know, I have a, an oven that cleans itself, right? Um, so, you know, there may be people 20 years from now who are like, oh, I just got to get myself some, some easy off so that I, and a pair of gloves and boy, I'm going to go after my oven. It'll be so much fun. I'll, and I'll, and I'll uh, Twitter all my, or tweet, you tweet, you tweet? Yeah, I can tell I'm, a, I'm an older person. I don't do it, so I don't know the name of it. I've got to put it up on Facebook that I clean my oven, you know. Here's the dirt before, here's the dirt after. Who knows, you know? Well, actually, I'm working on a book about building codes, which sounds deadly dull compared to the uh, the other things that I'm uh, that I've done. Uh, but what I'm uh, what I'm interested in is injury epidemiology, which is my second book is about asbestos and fire. Uh, and I'm interested in how um, all the rules that go with our built environment, building codes. Uh, if you go out, if you go out and walk around in New York City uh, or anywhere, uh, just sometime when you're not thinking about anything else. Take note of how much of the built environment has to do with protecting ourselves against danger. The curbs on the street, the lines that are painted on the street, the traffic signals, all the signs. These are all aspects of the built environment that, that help keep our, our death rate down. And parts of the world where they don't do that kind of thing or where they don't, they don't read the signs or pay attention to them, and there are unfortunately a lot of places like that, uh, they have the signs but they don't read them or pay attention. Um, they have a much higher death rate. And I, I, it's a much more serious and somber subject than, than the, these other things. I sort of go back and forth between death and destruction and fun and games. Uh, and, it, you know, it kind of keeps li uh, life interesting. And I think that the most fascinating thing about, about the, the work that I'm doing now uh, that, that, that s strikes me, um, the, I think the, the most interesting insight is that it's not so much having a democracy that makes those codes, those building codes and safety codes work. It's the habit of democracy. That it just, you know, making your country a democracy, you know, doesn't m inculcate that habit. But we're accustomed to, like, you know, our, in elementary school, we learn Robert's Rules of Order, right? And so we're accustomed to the parliamentary procedure and, and kids in Britain, same thing, you know, they, they know all about that. Uh, and by the time, you know, a, a few generations have gone by, you're used to the idea that you don't run red lights. You don't, you know, ignore signs that say, wrong way. <laughs> uh, you know, they, you, 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 you don't cross that ye the yellow lines if you want to stay alive. Uh, and that, that that somehow is a part, even though, although it's an ordering, and some people would say uh, a, uh, a kind of a hegemony over people's lives, it really does seem to be a tool of, of keeping people alive in democracies. And that, it's, a, it's an elaborate way of putting it, but you, you, I'm sure you, you see what I mean, that it, it, it's, a, it's a lifesaver. <laughs> and keeping people alive is one of the functions of democracies.